Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Science Podcast. This is episode 42, another Q&A session where I'm going to be responding to your questions sent over Instagram, YouTube, and I'm also going to dip into the YouTube comments as well to see what you've been asking around certain videos that we've been sharing on the Boxing Science YouTube channel. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about a range of different subjects, including how to work around a lead shoulder injury, which is very common in boxing. We're going to be talking about plyometrics for heavyweight boxers, whether cycling is a useful conditioning tool in boxing. Also, a range of different questions that you've been sending in. So you might notice we're in a little bit of a different setup today. We've got some different lighting going off as we are in our new studio. The studio isn't finished yet. It's basically a room with the, the lights that we've already purchased. We're in the process of decorating the space, soundproofing it, make sure that we've got some proper kit in here for the podcast. So we're taking our content game to the next level. The podcast, we're going to be having guests come in from coaches, athletes, practitioners, all working in boxing and combat sports. If you're not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button because we're gonna bring some really, really good content coming soon. This is part of our expansion at the Boxing Science Performance Center. You might have seen it on a previous video where we're explaining what the expansion is about, the space and everything like that. If you haven't seen that yet, go check that out. Myself and Dr. Alan Reduc went down to Northampton to visit the ice bath company to try out their infrared sauna and their ice baths. The ice baths were set at five degrees. Myself and Alan got in and put our mental state to the test, getting into the ice bath, five degrees, it was tough. Really excited to have this a part of the performance center to expand our services to our athletes and also to you guys that are watching that might be interested in coming down to the Boxing Science Performance Center as we're gonna be expanding our services and hosting training camps here at Sheffield in the UK. So if you're interested in this, just drop me an email, dannywilson at boxingscience.co.uk. Let's see what the future holds. Let's get on with this week's episode of the Boxing Science Podcast. Question from Maxi Daniel 5 If your left shoulder is severely injured, should you keep training with your jab or no training? If it's severely injured, you can't punch with, with one hand. This is something that we get quite often at Boxing Science where an athlete's either injured in their shoulder, in their elbow, in their hands where they end up having to get injections or something like that. It's always a question around should they be doing one arm training. I think that there is a need to do something like one arm training as long as that you're equaling out the volume with shadow boxing, weighted shadow boxing or something like that. At least you're doing something with this lead hand. You can't use it and it's in a sling. There's no point doing like kind of upper body work because find that there'll be a lot of imbalances, not only for your arm and your shoulder, but also compensatory patterns that's happening in the trunk and even in the lower body as well. So if the arm is like, you can't use it at all, I'd say take yourself away from any kind of upper body training stimulus, more focus on lower body and trunk, some conditioning work. If you can use that hand, but you can't punch with it in terms of like impact forces, then I'd be doing a lot of shadow boxing, a lot of technical drills. Even if you're hitting the bag, maybe like kind of have a shadow with, with the lead hand in between. Just make sure that you're getting some sort of stimulus through this lead hand to make sure that that imbalance that you might be creating from one arm training is minimized. You will get an imbalance. You might have to try and minimize that through your strength and conditioning work, try and do as much learning through that injured arm as much as you can, whether that's with BFR, cuffs or isometrics or anything like that. Not particularly trying to train one side. If this one side can do everything from punching to lifting heavy weights to throwing heavy medicine balls, you don't want to be creating too much imbalance between your left and right side, your injured side, your non-injured side. Try and get as much done, but not create like a massive imbalance. Adapting your boxing training, making sure you're doing a lot of shadow and drill work, make sure that you're achieving some sort of balance between the injured and non-injured side. Big Gesto has asked types of plyometrics for heavyweight boxers. Really great question this because there's a lot of considerations to take when doing plyometrics for heavyweight boxers. There's a few little things. One, the heavy. So how are they able to express force through a jumping action? Because they're having to move a lot of mass, they might not actually be able to jump that high. This can feel awkward to them. It can affect the amount of force that they're able to create during that action. And also because it doesn't feel great to do, they might not engage with it as much. So it's finding different ways to make sure that you're optimizing 
that rate of force development and momentum. So I'd like to do either assisted jumps or resisted jumps, whether that's assisted with the bands or with a bar. So like band assisted pogos, bar assisted pogos, and some free short ground contact work, and maybe even a banded counter movement jump, taking a little bit of load off so they're able to express that force very, very quickly. And then looking to resist the jumps through like bands or through dumbbells, just because we're increasing that mass doesn't mean that the jump as high, but they have to develop force very quickly to get off the ground. Something like dumbbell counter movement jumps, banded jumps and everything like that. So with heavy weights, something that you've got to consider is what goes up must come down. So when heavy weights jump, they obviously need to land. And when they land, they're coming down with increased weight load, which will increase the impact forces. And let's say if the heavyweight boxers might have mobility issues as well, might cause compensatory patterns. So this is increasing the risks and the dangers of doing plyometrics with heavyweight boxers. So a key consideration is to think about how do we reduce the impact forces? So doing the assisted jumps is really important. Counter movement jumps and loaded counter movement jumps will often put in a box, doing box jumps, as the height that the athlete is, is jumping, obviously we're increasing the, the jump height through a stimulus, through jumping onto the box, but actual that kind of displacement in terms of how they're landing is very, very small. So this is reducing them impact forces there. So with heavyweight boxers, we're looking to assist the movement with band assistance, bar assistance, anything to try and take the body weight away. We're also trying to load them up to increase that force stimulus, to increase the momentum values. Then also we're looking to try and reduce the impact forces. So the plyometrics a safe and effective exercise for heavyweight boxers. Ang underscore Joker has asked, is cycling good for boxers or does it slow the legs down too much? So I wouldn't say that it slows the legs down, but would I say that it is an optimal way to condition a boxer? With cycling, you need a certain amount of leg strength, efficient movement, you need to get the technique right. With boxers, because they're not cyclists, they're not particularly strong in the lower body, they might struggle getting the fitness adaptations needed, especially when boxers are really fit. So when they're getting closer towards competition, it's hard for them to achieve the right amount of power, RPM for a certain amount of duration to get the adaptations that's needed. Whether that's for muscle buffering, when we're trying to hit a certain blood lactate level, definitely for red zone conditioning. When we're looking to improve aerobic adaptations, cardiovascular adaptations, boxers struggle to get into that 90% of the maximum heart rate because they're just they're too fit for the bike and they're not efficient enough on the bike as well. When we need to use the watt bike is when we're doing some off feet conditioning. We normally do the air bike because it's a full body stimulus and we can get them adaptations there. When using the watt bike, we often do either repeated sprint interval training. So something that's quite short and sharp and looking for them spikes in muscular acidosis. But if we're looking for some red zone conditioning, this is done at the very start of training camp where we alter the volume and the intensities to try and get up into that red zone. But when an athlete is, is more unfit, so it's more likely to get some red zone adaptations from there. When they get into the main stages of training camp, we often have to use different stimulus to make sure that they still get their red zone adaptations. This is where we put the watt bike in the altitude tent. The altitude tent, reduces the percentage of oxygen. So this increases cardiovascular demand, which means that we're able to then get up into the red zone whilst on the bike. In summary, there's use for doing what bike training and using cycling in boxing, mostly in off season or very start of training camp, working with athletes that might not be able to run if they're having to do some off feet conditioning. When doing this, we need to make sure that we're adapting the volumes and intensities to make sure that we're meeting the side adaptation because boxers are very, very fit, but they're not as efficient or as strong. They might be quite understimulated using cycling to achieve them physical adaptations that are required. So we're going on to the YouTube questions now. So Dean G. Wolf has asked, do you recommend the use of white belts, straps, etc., Or do you think it, that it's better not to use that stuff during training? Yeah, this is a question that I get quite often, especially in the gym where boxers are just wanting that little extra percentage to, to try and help them. So let's start with weight belts. Boxers need a strong trunk. We know that 
in our research, the stronger that the trunk is, the more muscle mass that you have around the trunk, the more likely that you're going to be able to punch harder. It's a huge physical contributor to punching power. We're very limited on the amount of time that we're actually spending in the strength and conditioning gym. Our athletes are only training twice a week in terms of strength and conditioning. They might train their core three or four times a week, especially when you think about how important this physical contributor is, is this enough training stimulus for them? So we need to make sure that we're optimizing every single session. The trunk gets a lot of stimulation through compound lifts, such as squatting, such as deadlifting. So if we put a weight belt on our athlete, we're reducing the amount of trunk activation. Yes, we're getting better numbers on the bar. Yes, we're protecting the back a little bit more, but we're not getting that trunk activation, which is more important for punching power than what it would be putting an extra five kilos either side of your back squat or your deadlift. I'd be like looking, right, I want to try and increase core strength, trunk strength. I want to try and optimize that as much as we can during a compound lift. Putting the weight belt on will decrease that. I'm not bothered about an athlete beating their PB by five kilos just because they get a, a weight belt on. I'm just looking for proper technique, rate of force development, speed and intent, and keep that trunk strong. And that will transfer into your athlete becoming fitter, faster and stronger. So moving on to wrist straps, similar kind of concepts really to the weight belts. We're looking to try and improve grip strength in a handful of sessions. And most grip strength exercises are using little weights, whereas like, like reverse curls, reverse wrist curls, banded turnovers and stuff like that, these are really important, but they're done at really low load. Whereas like on a deadlift, you're exposing grip strength a lot, challenging your grip strength a lot under increased weight load. You're taking something away from what's quite important for you. So I prefer not to use a wrist strap just because it's giving that exercise more bang for its buck. It's not only developing lower body, not only developing the core strength, but it's also developing your grip strength that can help improve the strength in your hand and in your wrists and help protect the most important tools in boxing. Now with wrist straps, I would say, I would allow it sometimes. Let's say if an athlete is getting up to them high numbers, let's say 2.2 to 2.4 times their body weight, and they're looking to try and improve their PBs or the amount of weight that's on the bar, I would allow for wrist straps then if grip strength is a limiting factor. Grip strength is going to be developed enough or stimulated enough at them high loads anyway. So if you put on a wrist strap there under like something that's 2.2, 2.4 times your body weight, I'd probably allow that for athletes. But like I said, when an athlete is developing, grip strength needs to be developed as well. And no better way to do that through some heavy lifting. I've got a question from Ashton Carcio, 1571. This is on YouTube. What do your boxers do immediately after their workout for recovery, like stretching, foam roll, etc.? I don't put too much emphasis on what they do at the end of the workout. It all depends on what they do. If they are doing a strength training workout, might tell them to have a little bit of a stretch, might finish off with doing a little bit of core training, a, a core finisher. A lot of their mobility is done at the start of the session. No real need to do any mobility at the end. If they do an intense run, what I would do is do a cool down. So like a five minute, 10 minute walk on the treadmill to bring their heart rate down and also take advantage of their heart rate being quite elevated to burn a few extra calories in the session. Then I'd finish off when they've done a hard run, finish off with some static or PNF stretching, stretching out the hamstrings, the quads, working on their rotational mobility as well. So when they've done a run, this is probably when I probably do some more static stretches and PNF stretching. When they're in the speed strength phase or even in a tape session on fight week, I normally finish off a session just with some med ball slams, some rotational med ball throws, because I want an athlete leaving the gym feeling great, feeling fired up and ready for the next session or feeling ready for the next day. It all depends on what stage an athlete is at in their program, what they need to work on as an individual, but also depends on the kind of session as well. So this is commenting on our recent video of Lerone Richards doing circuit training workout. Taylor Strutch1469 has asked, those intervals seem a little bit long. You simply can't keep at very high intensity for long. In this workout, 
is three minutes on, one minute off. And we're splitting up the three minutes into working sets, one minute run to help stimulate a heart rate response. And then we've got three exercises at 30 seconds on and 10 seconds off. Now what Taylor's saying here is a valid point. You need to make sure that the intervals are short enough to make sure that athletes are training at high intensity to stimulate a heart rate response. So we're not wanting anything like 40, 45 second intervals. 30 seconds is probably the max that I'd go to. The reason why we use 30 second intervals in this session, Laverne's at the very start of his training camp. So what we're doing is keeping it volume based at the moment. And because he needs to improve his, his fitness, still able to get up into that red zone, even over a long duration. So he's needing more volume than intensity right now. Over the next few weeks, what we'll do, we'll shorten the volume and increase that intensity because he's got that fitness there to produce high intensities to then get up into the red zone. So if we were doing 20 seconds with Laverne now at this stage of training camp, he wouldn't be able to perform the right amount of intensity to stimulate that heart rate response. So we're going for a longer interval of 30 seconds to have that volume there to make sure that he's still working and working and getting up into that red zone. So it all depends on the athlete, depends on the exercise that you're using. So you notice that we use the run at the start, which is 60 seconds. This is enough to get the run up into the red zone. If we did 30 second intervals here, the volume wouldn't be sufficient enough to get to stimulate that heart rate response. And then doing like stuff like burpees and air bike and, and doing the battle ropes. If we did that for a minute or 45 seconds, it'd simply be too long. It all depends on the exercise that you're using the athlete that you're working with, and also the stage of camp that they're in as well. Another question on this workout, fantastic edit by Jamie, by the way. This is awesome. How many times per week do you recommend doing this? And how does it compare with the weeks leading up to competition? So with circuit training, it's something that I put in, in place of a run. So if an athlete struggles with like kind of running loads or wanting like some sort of different fitness stimulus, I'd put this in the place of one run. So I'd only do this circuit training once per week. It's an amateur athlete that's looking to do a circuit at the back end of the boxing sessions. I'll be doing this two or three times per week. I'm just responsible for the strength conditioning. So the strength training and the running conditioning. I'm only responsible for three to four conditioning sessions per week. That's three high intensity sessions and one recovery session. I'm only going to do circuit training once within that week, but circuit training can be used as part of the boxing sessions, finishing off the boxing sessions two or three times a week, finish off with a body weight circuit or back circuit or something like that. How does it change as we go towards competition? I just mentioned then, as the weeks progress, we'll change some of the exercises, we'll change some of the volumes, some of the intensities, to make sure that we're working towards more speed adaptations as we get closer to the fight. In terms of the frequency, how many times a week, we keep this quite consistent all the way through training camp. So a comment on the top 20 medicine ball exercises for boxing. Can I do these throwing exercises with a 12 kilo slam ball? So I'd say that 12 kilos is quite heavy. We actually did assessments using the medicine ball punch throw with the output sports device to see where we're optimizing speed strength during a med ball punch throw. And what we found was it's quite individualized, but most lighter boxers are between three and five kilos and heavier boxers, such as light heavyweights and above, are between five and seven kilos. Anything above this in terms of weight, that's literally moving too slow to stimulate speed strength adaptations. This is obviously just for the medicine ball punch throw that we assess, but this can be kind of utilized across different exercises. So this is when we're looking to increase speed strength. So such as medicine ball punch throw, rotational med ball throw, it's around about the same weight, three to five kilos for lighter boxes, five to seven kilos for heavier boxes. When we're doing different medicine ball exercises, looking for different adaptations. So for them exercises just mentioned, we look for speed strength adaptations. When we're doing something like a med ball chest throw, we're looking to try and increase strength speed increasing impulse and momentum as this transfers into increases in rate of force development, increases in punch power. So when we're looking at the velocities performed during a medicine ball chest pass at lighter loads to heavier loads, we find that 
performing lighter loads, but actually unstimulating athletes quite a lot when we're looking to try and increase impulse and momentum. We try and go as heavy as possible. So this is where the 12 kilo to even 18 kilo medicine ball might be more appropriate for this kind of exercise. And then we also found was if we added a band to it, the velocity drop off wasn't that much. So we increased the amount of load with around about the same velocity, which helped increase our impulse and momentum during a med ball chest pass, which is optimizing this exercise to promote the desired physical adaptation. And if we're doing this just for, for one exercise and one set, but if we put this along a, a four week phase of a training camp, this can be really, really crucial when trying to promote the appropriate physical adaptation. Answer to that question, it all depends on the exercise that you're doing and the adaptation that we're wanting to target. For speed strength exercises, a 12 kilo slam ball will be too heavy, but if we're looking for strength, speed, and to optimize momentum, a 12 kilo medicine ball might be appropriate for you on these exercises. So a question from Mark, T-E-8-K-Y, on YouTube. It's asked, why use a band when you can just add weights to it? This is on the 10 landmine punch exercises to increase punching power. So in this video, we use the uh, landmine punch and we add a band to it. And the question is, why add a band and not just more weight? The reason why we add the band, this is called accommodating resistance training, which is increasing the amount of tension throughout the lift. And this is really beneficial in increasing the amount of acceleration. If we just had more weight, we're able to try and produce force through that initial hip and torso rotation and probably able to relax through towards the end range of the punch. Whereas when we're using the band, we can't relax at all. We need to keep driving and accelerating through. So that initial acceleration is increased and then the acceleration all the way through the lift is increased and also the tension at the end of the action is increased as well. So. This is really important for length tension relationship. So the amount of tension that you can produce when your arms at full length, and this is really vital for increasing power in straight arm punches. So this is the reason why we use accommodating resistance, not only on the landmine punches, but across a range of different exercises, from back squats to deadlifts to upper body pressing exercises too. Question from BQ4416. I'd love to see the training methods of old school boxers. Hagler, Lennox Lewis, Sugar Ray Leonard, Sugar Ray Robinson, Duran, McCullum, etc. Is it possible? Well, a lot of people have requested it on the Boxing Size React series. We actually started doing more retired fighters now. Uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao, whether they're actually retired because they're coming out for exhibitions and everything. But yeah, I'm more looking at like kind of old school fighters, wanting to look at Mamid Ali as well. The only thing is that there's very limited training footage, so I might have to do old school boxing all together and just like kind of list off some of the names it said. So yeah, I'm really excited for that. And even though we're in a new school era of strength conditioning, sports science and evidence-based practice, there's still a lot to take away from old school fighters and old school boxers. So I'm always like wanting to keep researching, see how the champions train. And that's one of the reasons why I started the Boxing Science Reacts series in the first place, because I'm fascinated to see how Canelo trains, how Lomachenko trains, how Bivol trains, and trying to take as much from them and adapt it in a way that I can start implementing it here at the Boxing Science Performance Center with the champions of tomorrow. So that's the end of this week's podcast. Thank you very much for watching and listening. If not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content. Like I say, I'm investing into this platform so we need your support to make sure that we keep growing up the channel so we can do more, do more content, get more guests in. Yeah, I'm really excited for this next era of boxing science.